Dixie here. Today I want to do a recap and share with you some of the things I learned while I was out on the Pacific Crest Trail with my dog daughter Fancy May this summer. So mom and Fancy May ended up hiking about 150 miles with me. Now Fancy is an extremely anxious dog so I was hoping that getting out there would help her with some of that anxiety. Before we left we took some obedience classes together and her trainer and vet actually recommended putting her on a medication called Clomacalm, specifically designed for dogs who suffer from anxiety. And it seemed to help a little bit, but, but really it just kind of helped us with obedience training. Fancy's anxiety was so severe that she didn't want to eat in a different room than she was used to eating in. She didn't want to ride in a different vehicle than my truck, etc., etc. So we decided to go out for a little nature therapy this summer. As I purchased the gear that I'll go over in today's video for Fancy, I slowly introduced her to some of it and tried to make her familiar with it because I didn't want to get out on trail and just have this whole new lifestyle and experience with all these different items that she wasn't used to seeing and being around. One of the first things that I noticed when we got out there though is I wish I had spent more time toughening her feet up. I wish we had gone on more walks on the asphalt, not like extremely hot asphalt or anything like that, but just the rocky terrain with the trail being a little warm. I worried about her feet since she was used to being on grass carpet and hardwood and, and not that rougher terrain. So that was something to definitely consider in the amount of miles that we were doing starting off. So we just started really slow because not only were myself and my mother getting our trail legs, but also Fancy May. Now, while I spent time introducing her to her gear, we didn't really go out for a lot of hikes. We didn't test out the gear a whole lot. So I think that it would be a better idea, of course, to spend some time testing out gear. That way you know it's not gonna be something that irritates your pet. Luckily for me, I had my mom with me, so if something didn't work out and she needed to sit off trail with Fancy or we needed to travel to go somewhere to get something, I knew we would have a vehicle. But if I was gonna take a dog out on an extended hike with no vehicle and not having another person there to help out, then I would probably make sure ahead of time that everything was gonna work out well. It's just better for the animal that way. So because we did not do that, we were very mindful to check frequently for any kind of rubbing or irritation because your pet can't tell you, hey mom, I don't feel good. And by the time they're limping, then something could be you know, a little too wrong where you gotta take some time off trail. And that's another thing that I realized with hiking with Fancy is I don't really worry about myself that much. I'll take risks, but when I'm hiking with an animal that's depending on me and it's not her goal to fill in the fire closures on the PCT, she doesn't care. She's only there because I'm there, but that then becomes my priority to make sure that she's enjoying herself as much as possible. So if it seems like she needs a day off, then I'm going to take a day off. If it seems like she needs more breaks, then I'm going to take more breaks. So when you're hiking with a dog, it becomes more about what they need and less about what you want and or need. Just another few tips that I would like to suggest if you decide to go hiking with your dog. Some of the things that I would absolutely not go without is some extra water. So always carry a little bit more water than you think that you might need and or your dog might need. Plus one day of food. So I always for myself pack how many days of food I think I'll need and then at least one extra meal. So I did the same thing for Fancy. An umbrella because you never know when you're gonna be in an exposed area. Maybe you used to go hiking in an area that had a lot of tree cover but then there was a burn that came through and you find yourself in the middle of a hot day where the sun's beating down and now your dog has no cover. Several times on this hike I patted myself on the back for having an umbrella and being able to create shade whenever Fancy needed it, especially with her being a darker colored dog. Boots and boot liners or socks and shoes, whatever you prefer to call them, are also a must have for me because again Fancy's feet were not toughened up and also with exposed areas, you just don't know how hot the ground is gonna get. And the last thing that I wanna do is either have to carry my dog or have her have blistered feet. So having the socks and shoes, even though she was a little bit awkward with them to start with, was absolutely a lifesaver. And finally, an item that I didn't have, but if I went again, I would definitely carry, and that's a harness to rescue your dog in case something happens like they get a broken leg 
or get bit by a snake. It just makes it a lot easier to carry them out and get them some help. Now, for those of y'all who are wondering exactly what Fancy carried in her pack, she carried however many days of food she needed, again, plus that one day, and then sometimes some snacks, her food bowl, her boots, socks, mushers wax. Now it is said that the maximum weight a dog should carry is 20 to 25 percent of their body weight and I really feel like that's on the heavy side especially for a dog that doesn't go backpacking a lot and is used to just hanging out in the house and being a couch potato. So Fancy started off with way, way less than that 20 to 25%. Honestly, she never got up to that. Now she has a lot of energy and I'm sure that she probably could have handled more, especially after we had been out there for a little while. But again, I wanted her to enjoy this trip and really grow from it. And because I wanted her out there with me, I didn't mind carrying some of her weight. So let's talk about her gear. The pack that she carried was the Roughwear Palisades pack. And I cannot brag on this enough for the convenience of being able to have her harness on her and then easily attach or detach what I call the saddlebags or the rest of the pack that actually carries the stuff. <laughs> I'm putting it on backwards. Now you can attach the pack backwards because the four clips will work either way, but there's this cute little dog patch that lets you know that, hey, you've attached it correctly. Now we only had this pack, as I mentioned, for a little under 150 miles, but it seems like it's a pretty durable pack. There's not any noticeable wear and tear on it that I can tell and she certainly wasn't careful with it and held up in my opinion very well. I like all the pockets and pouches that are in the pack for organization. It was really more than we needed for what she was carrying, but it helped me divvy things up and I knew where everything was at any given time. The sleeping pad that she used was a Thermarest Z-Lite. I trimmed it down to where it was only six segments and I actually carried this for her as part of my pack. The pack that I used comes with a sit pad, but I just replaced that sit pad that adds a little rigidity to the pack with her sleeping pad. So it worked out nicely, but the sleeping pad seemed to work fine for her. It was great to be able to throw down on breaks and, and let her relax on it. And then in the sections where mom and fancy were not with me, I still used it and was able to throw it down and take a break on. So that was pretty nice. I saw several different portable dog beds, if you will, on Amazon, but I decided to go with a fleece blanket from Walmart. It seemed like it would be pretty warm and I believe it cost me less than $5 with tax. So it worked out just fine. I figured the fleece blanket would be warm enough with us hiking in the summer months, but there were some nights where it got down in the lower thirties and we covered her up with our rain jackets and even sometimes our puffies. And there was one night in particular where I threw part of my quilt over her to keep her warm. So she ended up being fine. But again, that just speaks to the point of sometimes you have to sacrifice some comfort for yourself for your pet. And so I was definitely willing to do that because I didn't carry a heavier blanket. Now in normal summer temperatures, I definitely feel like the fleece blanket would be enough, but it just seemed to be a little cooler on the West Coast this year than normal. Those were the items that I'd call Fancy's big three because she slept in the triplex tent with us. Of course, she didn't have her own individual shelter. And just a little note on that, the triplex worked well for having two full-size humans and a dog. Now for some of the accessories. We took the Roamer extending leash. I liked the look of it because it was bungee-like, so it would stretch out a little bit, but uh, if she was hiking a little bit closer to me, you know, I knew it would also retract, not necessarily retract, but not be stretched out. I liked the fact that I could connect the handle part of the leash. I could carry it as a handle. I could have also extended it and wrapped it around my waist and clipped it. And then also I was able to just loop the little handle area through my hip belt. Now with that, if she did end up pulling a little bit or I stopped abruptly, I did notice that my hip belt clip would break open. It wasn't the end of the world. I just picked it back up. But if that's something that you might be concerned about with your particular dog, then just keep that in mind with your hip belt that it may or may not be strong enough if they pull uh, tightly to, to kind of yank open that hip belt clip. So in that case, you might want to rig it up so that you actually hike with it around your waist. On the other end of the leash, I really like the way that the little connector works. It just, you kind of pinched it and it would open up and then loop easily onto either her collar or harness. And finally, one of the things that I was concerned about with the leash is, is the fact 
that it was bungee. It was something that I found desirable, but also was a little concerned with because maybe I didn't want her stretching that far away from me. But it's like they knew people would be concerned with that aspect of the design. So there's this built-in loop right near the clip where you connect to the leash and the harness that you can grab as a handle and pull back and keep your dog close to you. For her collar, we used a rough wear crag dog collar, held up just fine. And then the last little accessory was her muzzle. We carried the muzzle for the first several stretches, but after I saw that she was doing better and better with meeting dogs on the trail because she loves people, but she tends to be pretty aggressive towards new dogs that aren't part of her pack and she didn't grow up with. But I noticed that, that she learned out there like, hey, we can just step off trail and let this other dog pass and it's not the end of the world that another dog exists other than me. And I think a lot of her aggression is that fear-based anxiety where, hey, I have things pretty good because I almost starved to death in a trash pile when I was a puppy and Lord only knows what else happened to her. So she doesn't want to give that up for any other dog encroaching upon her territory. But I did learn that after a while she was absolutely fine with, you know, allowing another dog to go on and it just didn't seem like something that we were going to need. So we ended up culling out the muzzle. All right, now let's talk about food and water. For Fancy's water bowl, I thought it would be a good idea to use a Sea to Summit mug like I use for my coffee in the mornings, but I found that it was a little too deep and felt like something a little more shallow would work better. And I was collapsing a ring and it just wasn't working out as well as I hoped it would. So I ended up switching to a Kentucky Fried Chicken little side dish that you get green beans or mashed potatoes in. It says reusable on it. It was actually durable for the trail uh, and very lightweight. So by switching from the Sea to Summit mug that was 1.4 ounces to the little KFC container that was 0.2 ounces, we actually saved Fancy's pack 1.2 ounces. It was much cheaper than the Sea to Summit mug and hey, you get a little treat for yourself in purchasing that little dish to use. There was a one liter water bladder that came with Fancy's pack. I used it for a couple of stretches, but honestly, I just decided to carry her water myself. It was easier to balance. And again, I didn't want too much weight on her. So I just used my system of carrying smart water bottles and made sure I had a little extra for her. Most of the time she drank filtered water, but there were areas where we'd approach a stream or a creek and she just helped herself. So I tried to encourage her to drink the filtered water because of course dogs can get sick from dirty water sources just like people can you know sometimes she just she's a dog and she's gonna do what she wants i can't kill all of her fun for her food bowl she carried the rough wear trail runner ultralight packable bowl i really did like this bowl it was very lightweight very packable as it mentions in the name the only thing that i think might have made it a little bit better is if there had been a way to cinch the top of it closed or to seal it in case there was some leftover food that i save for later but that's why you always carry extra ziplocs because you never know when you might need them now let's talk about protecting those feces for fancy's boots we use the rough wear grip treks boots and the sock liners I would say the sizing charts for these are helpful, but definitely order them ahead of time because just like with people, feet can be weird on dogs. And even though it seems like your dog's foot measures out to a certain size and it should fit a certain boot, you're really not gonna know until you put them on and try. So I would recommend ordering these from somewhere like REI who has up to a year return policy or Amazon where you can try them on at the house and then send them back if they don't seem to fit within 30 days. I feel like the size sock that I ordered for her ended up shrinking and might have been a little too tight around the top. They worked out fine, but that's just something to keep in mind that the socks might shrink a little bit if you put them in the dryer. So if they seem to fit well when you get them, then you might just want to let them air dry. Overall, I think the boots were at times a lifesaver if the terrain was just really rough on her feet or if it seemed too hot to the touch. I was all the time touching the ground to see how the temperature felt, but I did learn along the way that when you're taking a break, if you can, if your dog's not too fussy about putting the shoes on and off, take them off while they're taking a break in warmer weather because that is one way that they're able to cool their bodies down. There are some improvements I feel like that could be made with the dog booties, and I wish that there was some kind of either built-in gator system or an added type of gator system because there was some debris that got down in her shoes, but I wasn't all the time wanting to pull them off and dump them and, and check them out. So if there was something to kind of help prevent some of that, I think that it would be good. Also, I wish the socks were longer 
because I couldn't tell if they were pulling down and balling up by her toes and you know I didn't want anything too uncomfortable. Usually dogs will let you know if something's going on with their feet but again it might be you know a little too late and there might be something really painful and sore starting to happen for them. I would say just keep a check on them especially when you're starting out and make sure that you're not having any issues. For Fancy's first aid slash med kit I definitely carried more than I do for just myself when I'm hiking. I carried gauze and neosporin which actually she never needed but I did end up needing so it was good to have. Also Pepto pills she got sick while we were in town, thankfully. I called her vet and he recommended Pepto because she had a little diary and, and was vomiting. Um, and then it ended up happening out on trail and I did not have that liquid Pepto, but they do make the Pepto pills. You can check the dosage that vets recommend online or check with your veterinarian even better. But from that point on when she was sick, I made sure to carry some of that. Also Benadryl. Now, some people say that Benadryl can help with snake bites other people say that scientifically that's not possible i'm not going to get into that debate here i will say that my vet told me that it would not hurt and if that's even just to calm her down while i'm carrying her out of the woods because she's been, been bitten by a snake or if she has an allergic reaction to a sting or anything else or say there's one night with me having an anxious dog where she was just freaking out then it's not a bad idea to have some Benadryl on hand and for humans we should have that anyway. And finally I carried Musher's wax and well actually she carried her Musher's wax but it's really good just to kind of help moisturize the feet and and to protect them and and just kind of overall care. Uh, I used it some I probably could have used it more uh, but she really didn't have any issues with her paws and I think a lot of that was attributed to just taking it slow and allowing her to build it up that strength in her toe pads. Now this is not part of her first aid kit but I feel like it should be included here. I got her the rattlesnake vaccine before we left town. There's actually the initial vaccination and then a booster a month later. If you live close to town then maybe this isn't something you feel like you need because you think hey I can get my dog to a vet and get them some antivenin if my dog gets bit by a rattlesnake. But in the middle of a hundred mile stretch if you're 50 miles in and you've got to get your dog out 50 miles or even 10 miles or you know more than just being right there by a car that you could get quickly to a vet's office it's a good idea to have the rattlesnake vaccination. My vet said that they've never seen a dog come in that had the vaccination that didn't make it. The vaccination does not mean that they won't have any reaction to being bitten by a rattlesnake but it does buy you time and from what I was told help minimize the effects of being bitten by a rattlesnake. So I felt like it would be a good idea and it was peace of mind for me knowing that I did everything that I could possibly to help with that scenario if it was to happen. I shared this when I was out on the trail this summer on the PCT in one of my videos and I said that I probably would not take a dog on a through hike and I still don't think that I would just because of everything I've got going on anyway with recording and, and making videos to share the experience. If I did, I would certainly start way sooner. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, I would make sure that it was something that I was doing a lot with my dog. So prepping by backpacking before I got out on a through hike. And I would just be sure to have a lot of extra time to take it slow and allow the dog to build up and allow them to have days off if they weren't feeling well. Humans need zero days, so do dogs, and sometimes they might need them at a different time than you do. So I just want to stress that I really do think it's important that when you take a dog out on a hike, you're hiking your dog's hike, you're no longer hiking your own hike. But with that said, I'm not all negative Nancy about having dogs out on the trail. I really do think that there are a lot of benefit, not only physically, but mentally. With Fancy and I, I feel like we bonded a lot more through this experience. I think that she came back a much more confident dog. I can tell so many things in her mindset have changed. She's no longer afraid to ride in strange vehicles, probably because we had to do that a lot with hitchhiking out there. She's excited to go for a ride. She doesn't care where she eats. She just loves that she's getting food. Uh, she just seems much more happy and comfortable in her skin. And, and I really am so grateful that I had the opportunity to spend that time out there with her. And I think that now that we've worked through some of those things, 
I can really start working with her on introducing her to other dogs and trying to deal with some of that fear-based aggression. She used to be skittish of meeting new people. Now meeting new people is exciting. And I also got to learn that she absolutely loves snow. I think I'm gonna have to get her a snow blower for Christmas because here in Alabama, we don't really get a whole lot of that. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today. I hope that that helps some of y'all who are thinking about backpacking or hiking with your dogs. If you have any questions about Fancy May in particular, the gear that we used, or you know any suggestions if you've got gear that works well for you and your dogs, then maybe some other people can learn from that by reading the comments. So feel free to leave that in the comments below. Thank y'all so much for watching. And if you enjoyed or learned something new from this video, don't forget to subscribe before you go. And we will see y'all next time.